The southwest wilderness of Tasmania is one of the most remote and inaccessible areas of Australia. Untouched by the blight of civilization, the Tasmanian wilderness is still swimming with life and beautiful rainforest views. If you wish to travel to its depths, you won't find a road beyond the edges to guide you there. What you may find close to the edge, if you speak to the right local, is the tale of the singing rainforest. It is said if you sing to it, the rainforest will sing back, putting you in a trance and disallowing you from ever leaving. Some believe it was a tale created by European colonists unsure of how to navigate the remote region and pillage its wealth. Their intention was to keep adventurers and profiteers from pillaging it first. Others believe it's just another old wives' tale used to scare children and keep them from wandering. Whatever the origin may be, my best friend, Olivia's curiosity, lay in the validity of its existence. Humankind has invented advanced tools to better our survival and comfortability on Earth, but with the same hand, squeeze the magic and mystery from it. Gone are the days of mysterious untold lands when you can fire up Google Earth, type in the Sahara Desert, and then see someone's grandma forgot their walker in an apartment stairwell at 23.42 degrees north by 25.66 degrees east. I'll be the first to admit, if these untold lands existed, I would not embark on a grand journey to see them. I would put it in my search bar and watch some YouTuber do it instead. Olivia, on the other hand, yearned for something more than a video or peer-reviewed article of words no one but academics understand. She wanted a tangible experience of the magic she felt the world had lost, and now that the magic was less than a three-hour flight away, I had to go too. Olivia was a prominent member of a dying mystery horror forum, Aussie Creeps. Justin, the person who had tipped her off to this folktale, was a long-term online friend from the Aussie Creeps forum living in Tasmania. His 90-year-old grandmother retold the story her grandfather had told her as a child. She had this to say, My poppy, that would be your great, great-grandfather had a tough life. It wasn't like today, Justin. You couldn't just go to a supermarket and even if you could, not many would be able to afford it. Poppy was out hunting with his father, praying for a wallaby or a kangaroo, but happy to settle for a possum. Sometime during the hunting trip, they ended up lost and wandered for days trying to find their way back. His father became ill, but continued giving the food they found to Poppy. On their last night together, he wrapped Poppy up in his possum skin cloak and told him if he woke up to find his father had passed, he should take the gold brooch from his shirt and sell it. The brooch was a beautiful piece from what Pop told me. It was a shovel and mining pick made from the very same gold he had mined in Ballarat. Luckily, the next morning, he found his father alive and they continued trekking through the rainforest. He told me they passed moss-covered rocks shaped like teeth before the smell of death burnt the hair in his nostrils, hoping to find an animal stuck in a trap, signaling some hope of a human's trace. They continued on. Instead, they found the forest floor littered with mushrooms resembling red starfish. At first, the sound was faint, but with time it became louder. A hum of voices similar to how those church folk do it on Sundays. They should have been happy to hear it, but the eerie way in which the notes struck their ears had Pop's father telling him to stay put. His father disappeared into the forest, and before long, a familiar voice joined the choir. Yeah, you guessed it. Pop's father wasn't the singing type, but he had joined them. Pop was scared and covered his ears while he followed his father's tracks. When he got there, something terrible had happened. He wouldn't tell me what he saw and only spoke of this story once, but it was horrible enough for him to run, leaving his father behind and never looking back. He was found by some folk 
in a near-death state somewhere on the border of the southwest wilderness. They didn't believe the boy. He was in a delirious state. But he knew what he saw. He said to me, Don't you ever go into the rainforest, Elizabeth. You hear me? But if you find yourself there, never sing back. Justin's commitment rivaled Olivia's, and using the information from his grandmother, he identified the red starfish mushrooms. It was a fungus called Acero rubra, known to grow in the southwest. The fungus gives off the smell of death to attract flies and spread its spores. Using descriptions his grandmother had given him, and information on growth areas of the fungus, Justin narrowed down our search to specific locations. It was thorough enough for Olivia and me to book time off and fly down to Hobart. Taking the scenic route from Hobart, we met up with Justin in a place called Strathgordon. Justin had told us our hike should take two weeks if we were lucky. Olivia and I were ignorant of the preparation and resources required to make the trek. We were lucky Justin had made this trip his obsession. He had packed all the essentials three times over and participated in several walks over the past few months. Our plan was simple and, in hindsight, it was probably too simple. We would hike to the spots Justin had identified and arm ourselves with cameras and earplugs. If we heard the singing, we would plug our ears and hit the record button. The days were wet, cold, and miserable. I found myself overwhelmed by the situation and on the cusp of quitting. The nights were often worse as the squeals of animals would echo in the darkness. There were many times we had awoken to the sound of animals traversing our campsite after the fire dimmed. Water had somehow made it into the sandwich bags holding Olivia's camera and we were left with Justin's. After two weeks of finding nothing, I suggested we head home, but they were adamant we trudged through the last area, leaving no stone unturned. Begrudgingly, I agreed to avoid being the person who ruined the trip. After another eight hours, we came across rocks suiting Justin's grandmother's description. Walking a few meters further, the smell of death blew past. Olivia and Justin were ecstatic, but I was unable to match their enthusiasm. For most of the trip, I'd been doubtful this place existed, and now it was a reality. I was scared. The rainforest floor was littered with red starfish fungi. Flies buzzed around us in greater numbers, and consequently, the humming began. A range of voices humming like a choir in the distance. My stomach dropped, and I rushed to find my earplugs. Digging through my bag, I found them and shoved them into my ears. Justin and Olivia did the same thing before walking closer to the sound. Trailing behind, I watched as they climbed over the rock face, and Olivia let out a scream, piercing through my earplugs. Climbing up, I looked down and held back my own scream. Corpses were scattered across the ground, some on their backs, and others still standing. Many had decomposed to nothing but bone, others still had remnants of rotting flesh ready to fall from their limbs. Some looked like hikers just like us while others wore clothing from simpler times, all covered in cream and white moss, with red starfish fungi poking out sporadically from the sockets of their eyes, skull, neck, and arms. Their jaws moved up and down as they hummed a song in unison, and my disgust could not overcome my curiosity. Justin tapped on my shoulder, and I jumped out of my skin. There, he mouthed, pointing to one of the bodies standing. The moss and red fungi covered a large portion of its body, but I instantly understood what he was pointing to. Only half of it was visible because of the moss spreading over the man's neck. 
but there was enough to identify it. The gold brooch from Ballarat was pinned to the man's collar. Holy shit, Olivia mouthed. Justin climbed down the rock face in the direction of these things. Olivia and I were shitting ourselves, but unable to look away. His feet hit the ground, and the bodies turned their heads toward him. He took slow steps in the direction of the man with the brooch, and his arms stretched out, intending to grab it. Olivia screamed at him, but I couldn't make out what she was saying. Brushing the collar of the man's shirt disturbed a swarm of flies, and they buzzed around Justin. The figures continued singing undeterred by his presence. Justin was in the process of unpinning the brooch from the man when his hand clutched Justin's arm. Justin tumbled back, taking the man's arm from its socket with him. Falling to the ground, the yellow earplug in his right ear fell out. He frantically tried to get it back into his ear, but within seconds, his face went blank, and his jaw mimicked the movements of the corpses surrounding him. Olivia jumped down the rock face and desperately tried to put the earplug back in his ear. Justin remained in a trance, and she grabbed either side of his face, screaming at him. Without warning, Justin wrapped her in a bear hug and looked up at me with a blank face. Olivia struggled to free herself and I climbed down to separate them. My attempts were useless. His grip was unrelenting. Pulling a small knife from my bag, I stabbed his arm in a panic. Justin didn't flinch and continued singing while blood poured from his arm. My actions only served to anger the corpses surrounding us, and the one still able to stand started trudging toward me step by step. At first, I waved my knife, threatening them, but I did little to halt their movement. They were not of this world, and my knife did not offer a worse fate than what they were experiencing. A man missing part of his jaw got close enough to swipe at me, but it was slow enough to dodge. There were so many of them. Panic set in as the corpses made desperate attempts to get closer. I'll get help! I'll come back for you! I screamed to Olivia. I saw the word no leave her lips as her eyes widened. I'm not proud to say it, but I left Olivia and climbed the rock face while I still had a chance to escape. Safe atop the rock face, I watched the bodies circle Justin and Olivia in some sort of demented group hug. Turning away, I left them there with the singing corpses and ran. Fear coursed through my body as irrational thoughts attempted to justify my abandonment. For two weeks, I was lost in the rainforest. Without Justin, I had no idea where I was going. They found me delirious, hunger-stricken, and inconsolable with the earplugs still lodged deep in my canals. The search parties found nothing, though they went on for days. Its remote landscape made it difficult for large search parties, and they couldn't spot any of my general landmarks from the air. Justin and Olivia's unrelenting pursuit of magic and mystery ultimately saw them become part of it. I struggle with the weight of guilt I feel for leaving them there alone. Sleep offers no comfort. When I give myself to the darkness, I find myself covered in moss, unable to move. Red fungus erupts from my skin, and I try to scream for help. The only thing to leave my lips is a faint song. One I listen to for mere seconds, but can never forget. Waking from this dream, my relief lasts for a moment before the feeling worsens. I could never muster the courage to go back and save my friends. <sighs>